so I mentioned that our theme this semester is about environmental engagement and sort of the different ways that we can engage. We've heard from different folks, it's different sorts of people who do this in different ways, be it art um, or sort of direct political action through NGOs. Uh, environmental issues are really complicated and in a lot of respects and in a lot of ways they cross the boundaries from what we might think of as an issue affecting the environment to issues that affect us, that affect societies, that affect people. Um, quite often they don't affect all corners of society and all different kinds of people the same. Some groups get it worse than others. Uh, and so there's a, a huge role for community-based efforts to try to do something about that. And so we're really fortunate tonight to be joined by our speaker, Maricela Morales. Uh, she has a, a lengthy career, and I'm gonna just hit the highlights and not even do it justice in a second here. Um, but I'll tell you that the organization that she's with now, which you're gonna hear more about, is called CAUSE, the Central Coast Alliance United for Sustainable Economy. And they do a ton of really important work that if you live in Ventura County, you have almost certainly benefited from in a, a very tangible, concrete way. Uh, and so engaging on environmental issues that have a, a, a social aspect is, is a big part of what they do, everything from coastal power plants to farm workers, issues that affect all of us in this community in very direct ways. Um, so we're really fortunate to have her here tonight. I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about uh, the <clears throat> normally my, the bios for the speakers are really short, and I don't I don't need to refer to my notes, but there's so <laughs> much in her bio that's amazing. And I think maybe the uh, <clears throat> goodness gracious, I don't even know where to begin. I guess I begin at her beginning, which is that, that Marcella is from Fillmore, so she is born and raised in Ventura County. Um, growing up in Fillmore, she was ex exposed firsthand to some of the social and environmental justice issues that were present in this county even then. She started working early and worked hard. She went to Stanford. The, the list of things you were able to accomplish and be involved in just in college um, should be motivational to all of you. Um, <laughs> and I won't recite the full list. You should come and talk to me just to see what one can really make of a college experience. It's, it's incredible. Um, she went on from there to get an MA in counseling psychology at PGI. And after continuing to witness sort of disparities in terms of what was happening in her community and what was happening in the local government in her community. Um, she ran for a seat on the Port Wyneme City Council and in 2002 was elected to the Port Wyneme City Council. She served there through 2010 and in 2007 we were the mayor of Port Wyneme, uh, uh, the first woman of Mexican, Mexican immigrant parent descent to ever hold an uh, elected office in Ventura County, so that's pretty fantastic. Um, She's been with CAUSE, the Central Coast Alliance United for Sustainable Economy, since its inception in 2001. She's going to tell you more about the really amazing work that they do. So I'll also mention briefly that she is currently an alternate on the California Coastal Commission. So any of you that care about what happens in our coastal zone and on our beaches, I still get to play a, a very, very, very direct role in the decision making for what happens on our coast, which is incredibly important and significant for us here in California. So it's really amazing that she's here and she's gonna share some of the work that she and Cause and her organization do and tell a little bit about her story, how she came to be doing the work that we're doing. So thank you so much for being here. Please a big warm welcome. And, and the last thing I'll say is that she's, so we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna go through her slides. So just hold your questions and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end and that way we can, we can She's gonna, she's got a spiel and we don't want to interrupt, so just go, go for it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dad. I'll stop now. That was the bestest intro. <laughs> <laughs> that was um, so uh, a couple of, of uh, clarifications. The thing for my bio that I'm most proud of, um, that I start my bio with all the time, is that I'm a daughter of immigrants. Um, my parents were from Mexico. Um, my first language was Spanish. Um, I didn't learn English until I was in first grade. Um, and, uh, and for me, um, in terms of who I am, um, I carry that very, very deeply and, and, and honor that um, in terms of where I come from, especially um, during these times um, where being Mexican 
Um, and actually, that's not new. <laughs> being Mexican in, in the United States and in California has, has never been a thing to be proud of um, in terms of how, how we've been treated historically. Um, and certainly in these days, um, it's, it's um, often used as a derogatory term to, to call you Mexican. So, um, so ever more so, I take great pride in being Mexican. Um, and um, uh, I wasn't born in Ventura County. I like to say oh. that I'm straight out of Compton. <laughs> 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 because I actually, my first three years of life, <laughs> I lived in Compton. Um, and that's where my parents first arrived, was to Compton, um, their whole familia. And then, thank God, we moved out to Fillmore because I can clear, even as a toddler, um, I clearly re remember the contrast between living in Compton and moving out to Fillmore. Um, and I loved Fillmore. I loved the ruralness of it. Um, so, um, so that's a little bit of clarification. Um, and the last, uh, just because um, I don't want to ruffle feathers, I'm not the first Latina or Mexican American to be elected in Ventura County. I'm the first to serve as mayor. So the first Latina was elected in Santa Paula in the 90s, then came a Latina in Fillmore, um, and then me. Um, but the true story is that I was the only one that to date has been allowed, um, and there's a whole story about that. But I happened to be allowed by my peers at the time uh, to, to serve as mayor, um, and my two predecessors were never allowed um, by their peers to serve as mayor. Um, and uh, so that's uh, a little bit more about myself. Um, so environmental justice, a universal tour from home. Um, I really love this title that you gave to the series in terms of citizenship on earth. Because me personally um, looking at environmental issues feels very apocalyptic to me. Um, when you look at um, videos or, or um, uh, yeah, media where it'll show you the now and the 20 years from now, right? And they'll show you the coast of anywhere, <laughs> Miami, New York, right? LA, San Francisco, and it's like right now, here we are <laughs> on the coast, right? And then 20 years from now, right? This is what it's gonna be like. And it's like where Ohio will be the coast. <laughs> um, and so uh, when I can see those things and, and then see how slowly our government is moving to do anything about it at every level, from the city council level, certainly up to the national level, um, then, then I, that's where my anxiety like, really ramps up. Um, uh, I have a four-year-old and I absolutely have thoughts where I think, you know, we never should have had it. You know, what, what have we brought him into? Um, so um, with, with that, I, I, my <laughs> current counter to sort of like balance myself out is, is actually to delve in cosmology and the <laughs> universe. Um, and uh, so the citizenship on Earth, uh, <laughs> that's like totally where I'm at <laughs> in terms of uh, citizenship on Earth. The galaxy. So take a moment to look at that and just connect with what does that image or any other image you, you hold of the universe, the you know, 93 billion light years of um, observable universe that we are currently aware of. Um, that's been around for 13.8 billion years. And what does that image inspire in you? What feelings come up for you in seeing the universe? Um, for me, I feel that it brings to mind both the um, absolutely profound reality that we have this, because in all of this, to date, 
as far as we know or can tell, intuit, there is no other this. And so at, in, in one instance for me, um, it's the comforting aspect that, um, thank God we can't damage the universe. <laughs> we're, da we're damning a whole lot of other stuff. <laughs> um, but in some ways, I'll, I'll say that because that connection between the environment and people, that in, in some um, ways, we don't matter to the universe. 13.8 billion years. <laughs> um, we've been around, what, 2 million, you know, if you really go back to, you know, really only 50,000 in terms of behaviorally, um, us being modern humans. Um, so in, in one sense, um, we don't matter. And yet, this pale blue dot, right? We absolutely are essential because we are clearly damaging this thing, this incredible, beautiful, wondrous thing that itself has been around four and a half billion years, right? And we both create from it things that wouldn't have come about had we not existed, that nature itself would not have created, right? Um, so the wondrousness and the power of that um, and the incredible, awesome responsibility that comes with that, that this, this beautiful, amazing thing that gives us life, that, that brought us to existence, that we have the power to destroy, at least destroy to the extent that it can sustain us. Um, I, I don't think that Mother Nature, I think Mother Nature is going to live beyond us. <laughs> Um, or could live beyond us, um, but but regardless, um, you know, we have the power to to um, sustain, preserve, you know, restore, and and, and continue to be um, or start being um, in sync with this amazing, amazing gift um, called Mother Earth, Madre Tierra. Um, and so, you know, coming down to earth <laughs> from the galaxies, um, beautiful coastline, right? Um, and then the contract. <laughs> <laughs> coming way down. <laughs> so from an environmental justice standpoint, go back, um, as a woman of color, uh, I've grown up with um, the stories, the, the public stories of conservationists, of John Muir and the pictures of Ansel Adams and knowing that the Sierra Club existed. Um, and uh, as a woman of color, not being part of that. It being very man, a white man's, being very much a white man's um, story. Um, and as I've come to do environmental work, um, what I, I come across a lot, and it's incredibly subtle, um, but this notion that conservation and the environment and the environmental movement <laughs> is a middle class to upper class white person's domain, that they've been leaders in it, that um, if it wasn't for them, um, our planet would have been destroyed, you know, a hundred years ago. Um, and, and there's also this sense of, you know, oh, you work in social justice, you work on people issues. What really matters is conserving the environment. Um, and that's where, again, going back to the big picture, it's ultimately about people. 
the only reason we care about the environment is because you like hiking, <laughs> you like the beautiful scenery, um, um, or you recognize that you needed to survive. And so I, I, there's been, and I, I believe that there's continues to be, even in this day where environmental justice is much more at the forefront, this, 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 this sense that environmental justice is somehow not pure environmentalism because it's so much centered around people and certain groups of people. Um, and that if you're a true environmentalist, what you really care about is just the environment for the environment's sake, you know, preserving national forests and the um, And the, the, the sense that, that, that somehow that is the true environmentalism, the conservation. Um, and, and that's where um, I feel and believe that, um, that we need to, to, to break that, that myth. Um, because the, self, the, the human self-interest is there for all of us. So then the question becomes, who are you saving the planet for? Are you saving it for yourself because you want the, the weak, you know, you want to still be able to go, you know, skiing and you want to be able to, you know, do your nice hiking, you know, um, or are you saving it for all humanity and thinking about, you know, not just what environments are precious to you, but what environments have been so um, uh, damaged, and who lives in those environments? And if you're if you're the type that that appreciates the environment so much, then then what is it to grow up in this environment? To have this be your backyard? To have no weekends of hiking in the beautiful Sierras and the Sespe River, um, then I think that if you are uh, that that that's the question that that everyone I believe have to have to ask themselves that believes that they are an environment an environmentalist to ask aside from me and whatever the environment means for me and why it matters. For what people, for what communities, do I want to also protect the environment for? And um, for us, it's for. In addition to you know the, the 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 grand you know beautiful places that that are public spaces that are that are there, ultimately for everyone to access. But it be for us, it begins here. It begins with the cleanups. It begins with just stopping the onslaught of yet one, you know, um, attack after another. So here in Oxnard, um, we actually came to to do environmental work because when we started 17 years ago, we started on economic justice issues. We started with the living wage movement of the time, which is now the fight for 15. Um, the increase of the minimum wage across the state. Um, we started on that, but 10 years in, thereabouts, it was the community who came to us and said, there is this plan to build an offshore liquefied natural gas terminal off the coast of Oxnard. This was in two, about 2006. And as cause, we said, you know, that's awful, but we don't do that. We don't do environmental justice here. That's a whole nother arena, right? And we just don't do that. Um, but they, thank God, they kept on us. And as an organization, um, our mission is to build grassroots power for social, economic, environment. well now, environmental justice. Um, it came to a point where we couldn't ignore it anymore. This is coming from the community. They're saying we need to get involved in this. So that's, that's how we came into the environmental work back in 2006. So that proposal, mm -hmm. Oxnard is the only city, there's only two cities in all of California that have more than one fossil fuel power plant. 
because most cities don't have any. <laughs> There's 500 cities, 430 cities in the state. Most cities have zero. Um, so of all the cities that do have some kind of fossil fuel power plant, there's only two that have more than one. And that's Long Beach and Oxnard. Long Beach has two. Oxnard has three. Um, and in, um, when the liquefied natural gas um, terminal was being proposed, um, at the time in, in 2006, um, it was all the rage across the nation that we were gonna run out of natural gas in the United States. Our own natural gas supplies were, they were gonna disappear. So we had to start building these import terminals on the coast um, so that we would have natural gas. There were about a dozen or so um, proposals between Tijuana and Tanada on up to Oregon. <coughs> and one, the one close to us was right um, off of Oxnard. So um, to, we already had three, so we had a super fun site. <laughs> Um, we already had three fossil fuel power plants. Well, at the time it was two, we ended up getting a, a third. Um, and they were coming to the doorstep of the coast, coastal doorstep of Oxnard for this proposal. Not Malibu, just a little ways up, not Santa Barbara, just a, or down, a little ways up Oxnard. Um, and in 12 years of doing environmental justice work, there is always justification from very good people, very good people, to place these things in communities of color. When, when we tell them, you realize this is a community of color that's got all this crap. You know? Oh, no, 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 but that's not why we chose Oxnard. <laughs> like, there is always a justification. Um, so they, they were proposing it off of Oxnard. This, this LNG terminal, <laughs> The plan was it for it to operate for 50 years, 24/7. It would um, it would have been the largest emitter of um, emissions, natural uh, or climate change, um, in the entire three-county area, right, off the coast of Oxnard. Uh, the, the, the company was the largest mining company in the world, literally. BHP Billiton, based out of Australia, has decimated Papua New Guinea with their copper mines there, has, is in South America, it's all, it's all over the world. Um, and, and during that time, they were one of the 10 uh, largest lobbyists in California. The Prime Minister from Australia, came out to meet with then Governor Schwarzenegger. Th this project, so that was specifically for this Oxnard project. Um, and so we organized over a couple of years, it takes a couple of years to make these decisions. The final hearing in Oxnard, we had 5,000 people come out. And the beautiful thing about it for us is that it was young people that were at the forefront, <coughs> teenagers, from the local high schools. It was a Mixteco community, um, originally from Oaxaca, um, that were very much at the forefront of the public engagement. We won that battle. And, and the we is definitely a we. It's the Environmental Defense Center from Santa Barbara that did all the legal work, you know, hadn't been involved. That would have been a problem. You know, if the city council hadn't taken a strong position, um, that would have hurt us. But the people power was absolutely essential. Absolutely. Um, because with many of these decisions, you know, we like to think that decisions, public policy decisions are made on the very technical, rational, you know, <laughs> the facts. No, I guess you have to point to something, right, to inform yourself and to base your decision on. But half, if not more, of decision making, we're people, right? We're moved by one vision or another, by one set of folks in the crowd, you know, versus versus others. 
So the, the grassroots organizing was absolutely essential in that. Um, so we stopped that. Recently, with the Fuente Power Plants, that was in 06, we, we tried to stop a, a, um, a peaker plant um, in around 09. We weren't successful in that. They built it. <coughs> um, and then Fuente comes along about four years ago. So 2006, 2009, four years ago, 2014. Like, this is, I keep it coming, you know? I mean, these are big fights. Um, so Fuente comes along. It's led by NRG, which is one of the top 10 fossil fuel energy companies in the nation. It's also ranked by Mother Jones as one of the top 10 worst polluters in the nation in terms of fossil fuels. And that's who was proposing this project in Oxfam, NRG. And when we started the campaign, um, everybody was telling us it's a lost cause. Like, it's, it's, it's going to happen. And we even believed that it was pretty much a lost cause. But we said, we, we still, we, we have to try. Uh, we can't just um, give it up. We're in fight. Um, and four years later, we have run NRG out of the Central Coast. They, um, the California Energy Commission um, was recommending the, the lead commissioners on this project um, contrary to staff recommendation, uh, as of last year, was recommending a no vote on the Puente Power Plant. Um, and NRG just um, a few weeks ago, uh, it was in the LA Times, that they publicly announced that they were um, no longer pursuing the Puente Power Project, and they, they were closing the Ormond Beach Power Plant, which they own, and the Elwood Power Plant in Molina, which they own. And that came as a result, again, of the lawyers. Environmental lawyers are absolutely important. Public decision makers, in this case, um, local public officials, city of Oxnard, having no money making the investment to fight, um, and the grassroots power. And, and again, it, it's been the young people, the high school students, uh, millennials, uh, that were at the forefront of that grassroots organizing effort uh, to, to defeat it. So, um, you know, our vision is that everyone can enjoy this type of environment, whether as a place to visit or as a place to live nearby, everyone. Um, and we start here because even though the, the U.S. aspires to that all, justice for all, and it's founded on, you know, um, on that notion, you know, that all men, people, uh, are created equal, you know, to, to, to make that all actually inclusive has always been about social justice movement. Um, and so, so for us, we start here. We start at, at, at the ground level in terms of where are the communities, where are the people that are, at, that are actually bearing the disproportionate burden of unhealthy environments. Um, so another um, realm of the environment, agriculture. Ventura County is about um, eighth, it always teeters around seven, eighth, ninth, in the state in terms of agricultural market production value. So 58 counties in California, and out of those, we were about seven, eight, or nine, thereabouts, top 10, in agricultural market value, okay? We're in ag county. So beautiful, right, green fields. Ventura County is number one statewide in the, in the amount of pounds of pesticides per square mile. Number one in the state. We're eighth in ag production value, number one in pesticides. 858,200 pounds per square mile of pesticides going into our fruits and vegetables or on or under, over. Um, number three is Santa Barbara County, number two is Monterey County. Number, but just to see the, like, it's only one to three and yet 
the difference. Like number three is 195 N, and number one though is what, seven times that or four? Big difference. Number one in, and so all the, you'll see up there in terms of the worst score, so Oxnard, Camarillo, this campus is in the midst of that. Um, in terms of pesticides. So again, like who does, who is directly, most directly first impacted by that? 26,000 farm workers that produce the <laughs> eighth largest amount of mar food market value in the state. And when we talk about, you know, there's, a, there's a reference to, you know, like um, to workers or in other things, you know, like on the backs of. With farm workers, it's literally on the backs of. This, this incredible agriculture that feeds the world because much of the ag that's produced here is exported. So it does go, it goes to the rest of the nation, um, but it also is exported internationally is on the backs of 26,000 workers. And they're the ones that are on the front lines of these 858,000 pounds of, um, of pesticides that are applied. 30% um, women of childbearing age. We work a lot with the Mixteco community. And there are partners in the Mixteco and Vicana Community Organizing Project out of Oxnard. Um, from, from Oaxaca, and when they look at the incidences of learning disabilities, of miscarriages, of um, uh, any, uh, yeah, with their kids, and, and think about and compare to, to um, kids, you know, back when they lived in Oaxaca, like, for them it's obvious that like, wow, we're in America, we're getting paid more relative to what we would be getting paid in Oaxaca. But like, you know, our kid, you know, our instances of like reproductive problems, of like having kids with, you know, learning disabilities, like it's not what it was in Oaxaca. Um, and um, so the fact that 30% of, of farm workers are women of childbearing age should really concern us. It's a gender justice issue, a reproductive uh, justice issue, because they're exposed, um, their child, you know, in utero, right, yeah, are exposed, you know, for as long as nine months. I mean, because they'll work as long as they feel economically they have to, right? And and at any point in your pregnancy, you know, there's leave. One of the things we tried working on at the state level. Um, or we're trying to work on at the state level, some kind of protection for women who work in um, in jobs where they are, they are exposed to chemicals, so nail salons, um, farm work, you know, others, for them to have some kind of protection throughout their pregnancy, um, not just at the tail end when they're about to give birth, because in terms of the exposure to chemicals, that's um, not safe at any point in your pregnancy. 90% um, Mexican immigrant, 82% ineligible to vote. So they have no voice. Farm workers have no voice um, with politicians. Um, and so hence why um, a lot of our, fo our focus has been around, in terms of agriculture, around farm workers. Um, when we bring these things up, um, you know, it, it, it's really troubling for us because we're, we're not bringing this up because we want to give any industry a black eye. But the ag industry feels that way. And when we bring this up, they absolutely um, aim to bring our work down because um, they, they feel that we are somehow trying to bring ag down. Um, and our thing is we need sustainable agriculture. Uh, this isn't even good, pesticides are not good for uh, climate change and 
for in terms of the health of the soil. You know, Governor Brown has now invested um, um, in healthy soils, so there's this interest in healthy soils. Um, it, pesticides are not good for the for for the soil. Um, as climate change is impacting agriculture, like we need the mo most robust, you know, healthy soil we can have if we want to sustain um, uh, agriculture. Um, so it's from in in terms of pesticides, it really is an incredible place where the environment and people, um, the health of the environment and um, and the health of people really intersect very very. Uh, closely, and where we have, we think, um, uh, very a lot of common ground. Um, so, so that's a, a another issue that that we work on. We've had recent natural disasters. This is a new arena for us, um, thanks to climate change, in terms of experiencing um, recently these natural disasters, which we anticipate we're gonna be uh, experiencing more of. So the, when, when the first, I believe it was the first, in, I keep, 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 the International Climate Change Panel. <laughs> IPCC. <laughs> there, that one, IPCC. Came out with one of its initial reports on, you know, on climate change about 10 years um, ago. Um, you know, even then they were already saying, you know, vulnerable populations, Low income. This is globally low income. You know, first, you know, developing countries, um, communities, um, uh, you know, non-Western European countries um, are going to be hit the hardest because so they have less resources to mitigate uh, against, um, to adapt, to protect. Um, and recently, they came out with um, another report that focused in on that. And it was more of the same. Communities of color, low income, um, are are going to bear the brunt of climate change. Well, well, it's it's here at home. So um, one is um, oops, sorry. In terms of in terms of um, farm workers. Um, only firefighters suffer from heat stroke at a higher rate than farm workers, and no occupation sees more death from it. So climate change and the workforce, <coughs> you've got a workforce where you know, we, we all, um, in general, the community sees firefighters as heroes, um, and it makes sense, right? In that time of need, if your house is on fire, you know, if the backwoods behind your house is on fire, like, yeah, they are absolutely our heroes. But the contrast between that and the people that work the environment, work the ground, so that we can eat um, and, and live, it's, it, and the amount of protection that they get versus firefighters is just, you know, so um, disparate. Um, he related annual death rate amongst farm workers, uh, uh, 0.39 for 100,000 workers compared with 0.02 for all US workers. Uh, so um, farm workers are very much on the front lines of environmental hazards and climate change, what we're seeing in climate change in terms of you know, um, hotter days. Um, and we're not we're we're not valuing them. Um, so na back to natural disasters. Um, an image of Montecito. That, I mean, that's where the, the deaths were, right? And there were about two deaths <coughs> um, around the Thomas fire. Um, but in Montecito, there were 23 with the mudslides. Um, and every preface was saying that any death due to you know, preventable or you know, natural or uh, or something like natural disaster is an incredible loss, and and our our goal should should be you know no deaths for you know anyone. And we also need to look if there are disparate mortality rates around climate change around disaster. So Montecito is 92% white, 76% owner occupied. 
Median home value, two million. A third of the deaths were immigrant families, low to middle income. A third. That does not add up. If you look at the age range of the deaths, they, the age range went from two years old to 80 years old in the 80s. So in essence, the whole lifespan, right? Like the, the disaster didn't know age, right? Um, if you look at the gender, 50-50. I think we have to ask ourselves, why is it that a third of the deaths were of low-income immigrant families when, at most, they would make up 8%? That, to me, to us, that is just staggering in terms of um, you know, showing um, the, the, the vulnerability of low-income communities. So, in terms of these families, um, two of them were extended families. Um, uh, it was uh, two young women in their 20s, uh, mothers. Um, their husbands were landscapers, and as families, they were living on the property that they served as landscapers. So the moms died, the wives' moms died in their mid-20s, and they each lost a child. One was two years old, the other was 10. Um, and so we're lifting this up because um, we think that it, it bears talking about. And, um, and again, I want to preface you know, uh, or repeat that, that all of those 23 lives um, are precious, um, and to have lost any life is a loss. And we also need to look at, you know, when when populations or sectors of population are disproportionately impacted. So strategies for for engage, engagement. So for us, it's grassroots organizing. It's that people power uh, that I was talking about uh, earlier. And organizing um, it for, for us, um, because we find a lot of people, you know, um, would say, yeah, you know, I organize. And, and so just to say there's all kinds of organizing. Um, you can organize an event. You can organize, you know, um, a fun drive, all sorts of organizing. But grassroots organizing, what that is about is about one, for us, going to, to, to individuals and groups of people that would otherwise not get involved, that nobody else is talking to. They're not linked to any club. They're not linked to any organization. Finding those folks that, what we say, are, are on the margins. Um, two, getting them to connect with their dreams, with their aspirations about what do you want your community to look like? Like, what do you want for yourself, for your, for your family? Um, and the hardest part is to connect them to their own power. That um, if I dream it, I can help make it happen. Not alone, not just me and myself, but together with others. And or so organizing, for us is a win unto itself. If we, when we lose a campaign, like yes, we lost the campaign and we're, we're disappointed, you know, um, we, we, we move forward with another campaign, but the real win always is about building that individual and collective power, which is about, for us, people really owning their own dignity saying, you know what, I'm, I'm better than this. Our community is better than this. Um, yeah, I, um, I can do something about it. And that, the beautiful thing is that it's transformational. Um, regardless of what happens afterwards, they are never the same. It's like you, when you're getting your education, like you, 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 
After a class, you're not the same. Right. After you get your degree, when you're done, right, you're, you're, you'll never be the same. Because now you've got, you, you've discovered more of who you are, you've claimed more of who you are. Um, and, and, um, and that's where we're aiming at with grassroots organizing. And the wins are absolutely, like, we want to win. <laughs> because winning for us, it's about who lives and who dies. It's not just like, hey, we won, we're number one. No, it's literally about, like, the, is your um, morbidity, your quality of life, going to be better or not? That of your children, that of your community. Are, are you going to live, you know, the California Endowment has this thing where you put in your zip code and it'll tell you, based on zip code, what your um, estimated length of life is. You look at Thousand Oaks and, and Oxnard and there's a 10 year difference. So for us, those wins absolutely matter because they're literally about quality of life, life and death. They are. So the wins, the, the wins matter, um, but the heart of it is that individual and collective transformation um, about what we believe is truly what civilization is. And civilization is, is about achieving a higher standard for what we are as humanity. <laughs> and for us, you know, uh, Gandhi was asked, you know, what do you think about civilization? And he said, oh, I think it's a nice idea. As in, we're not there yet. <laughs> because in terms of valuing every person, um, we're not there yet. <coughs> um, so I wanted to give you sort of, um, since this is an academic class, <laughs> um, you know, organizing um, uh, one way to, to, to think about it, because um, in terms of, of uh, tools um, or skills that you put into practice, uh, because um, it's absolutely um, uh, relevant and, and important. So these five practices of breakout innovation I only um, uh, came across uh, over the last few months, last year. Um, and it comes from, um, um, from some studies on social innovation. Um, and I think they actually uh, speak very much to um, the skills um, that we need to, to develop, not just as organizers or in doing um, organizing work, but in terms of institutional work, whether that's on a campus or whether that's in um, the political realm. Um, so number one, share power. And um, this piece about um, uh, sharing power, you know, they, uh, they actually speak to this in the description of it, that, that biomimicry studies uh, um, show that when power is concentrated in a natural system, the system becomes far less resilient and, and more vulnerable. It's bad to concentrate power. They're finding that in nature. Well, in society, I think we pretty much all know that <laughs> concentrating power <laughs> is not healthy. <laughs> Putting power in the hands of you know of a few, no matter how smart or uh, ethical or wise they are. So organizing, it, the 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 part that that politicians and and people in general don't like about organizing is is central to to power. If people become very uncomfortable. Um, when you are countering the status quo, when you are showing up and claiming your power, um, uh, people get very nervous. Uh, and so um, in, in organizing and in this work of environmental justice, we're try it's not that we're trying to, to now be the dominators, right? Like, you know, you've been oppressing me, so like, it's my turn, you know, like, you know, give me the power and I'll like, you know, I'll do what I want with it. No, it's about like, let's share. We need to figure out another way to be together. Um, and it includes sharing, the, not just ideas, you know, what do you think? Do you like blue? Do you like green? Like, there we can mix them together and get uh, what out of that. But, um, but no, let's, not just an exchange of ideas, but let allow, let me allow you influence the direction of, uh, of certain things. Let me influence and direct the shape of certain things. Like let's 
let's share what actually comes out of this. Uh, prioritize relationships. Um, this also is about um, uh, fairness. Um, but this comes up a lot in the environmental work because what comes up a lot in environmental discussions is all this technical stuff, you know, and the the the, the science and you know what does it say about you know what we should, the decisions we should be making and um, and that's absolutely important. But we need to be thinking about not just only that, not only the facts, but at the end of the day. Um, this is about people. This is about our common, um, our common ground, the common good, and about that relationship. Leverage <coughs> heterogeneity, which is basically we need to become more inclusive. You know, in a county like Ventura County, um, look at wherever you're from. If you're from Ventura County, you're from elsewhere, but you know we're we're essentially close to 50% Latino, about 45% white, and about five six percent. Um, Asian, African American, <coughs> um, and yet you know you look at um, the levers of power, you know the decision making, and it's still it's still virtually 100% white. So from from decisions of, of, uh, of power to you know down to um, um, every discussion, every interaction, like we we need to bring um, different voices in, and as it says here, not just for the for, for show or for it to like make a nice, beautiful, multicultural collage, but really because we're gonna learn how to share power together. Uh, legitimize all ways of, uh, of knowing. So going back to what I was saying about farm workers from Oaxaca, uh, we have no studies. Farm, the, the, the level of research that's done on farm workers is almost none. Like that, that, that statistic about, about heat-related deaths, was from a report by the Centers for Disease and Control that was published in 2008 that was based on data from 1992 to 2006. That's like the most recent um, data that I could find. There, there's, there's almost no research. So when we're doing the, any, anything on farm workers is so hard because one, farm workers are rarely researched, but two, so in the absence of that research, we would want their own personal experience to count for something. So we've been working on this Farm Worker Bill of Rights in the county for a couple of years. We surveyed 300 farm workers in person. We went to farm worker neighborhoods and just knocked on doors and asked, you work in farm work? Would you answer these questions? It's phenomenal. Okay. So to get those 300 surveys, we asked at least 600 people. <laughs> at least. Okay. <laughs> And so we took this to the Board of Supervisors. We put together a really nice academic, not academic, I won't even go there, a really nice professional report. Um, we took it to the Board of Supervisors, we shared these stories, and all you needed, and this is real, all you needed was for one grower to call them up and to say, this is not true. You know me. You know me. You've been to my farm. I. I am nothing without these workers. They are like family. Mm. That is not true. They're just trying to make us look bad. They don't care about agriculture. Literally, it took one grower <clears throat> calling, talking to a board of supervisor, and that whole two hour conversation we had where we brought farm workers in to share their own story, where we shared the survey based on 300 farm workers and their experience, their way of knowing, which is their lived experience, didn't matter. Didn't matter. So we need to legitimize um, all ways of knowing, which is people's lived experience. And especially if you're talking about low income, the marginalized communities, you, you've got to listen to, we have to do a better job of listening to like what their lives are about. Um, and then prototype early and often, and it, it basically, you know, in organizing all along the way from start to finish, we're continually talking with um, our group of grassroots leaders in terms of, hey, you know, let's talk about where we're at with this campaign, you know, 
And what did you think of that last meeting that we had? You know, and questions that came up, or what do we do next? And, um, you know, should we change our strategy? Um, that's related to prototyping. So five practices of breakout um, innovation in terms of um, organizing as a, as a strategy for, for engagement. It's tough work. It's tough work to engage. Well, like, you know, you made a pitch for your club, right? Like how many people? Well, I don't know what to <laughs> um, but you know, you'll yeah, you'll 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 give an announcement to a group of whatever, right? And like maybe you'll get one new person who comes in, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm exaggerating. I'm exaggerating. But the point is, is that to engage people, I mean, we all know, like we're all busy, right? For us to step into a new arena, right? Out of what we're already doing, because we're all already busy, right? It's, it's hard, especially when you're talking about folks that, that are coming from a place of like, I don't matter. Essentially, that's where they're coming from. Um, citizenship on Earth. So, to end with, we are all citizens of the Earth. That in and of itself is a powerful starting point. If we could really own that. We are all citizens of the Earth. Because not just people of the Earth, but Citizens, because citizens evokes power, authority, responsibility, yes, but also authority, right? Like, I too have authority to, to weigh in into what my community is going to look like. I should be also listened to. Um, every physical environment merits care and concern. Peoples disproportionately burdened by hazardous or unhealthy environments are sacrificed peoples and environments. So a fairly new term is sacrifice zones. That when you look at places that are disproportionately burdened, and they've got great tools now in, uh, in, in California in terms of mapping that out, like based on numerous factors, right? Where are the places where environmental justice, injustice, is concentrated? Um, and, and the new term that uh, is um, more popular in vogue is, is, is calling it sacrifice zones. Um, and so for us, um, bringing that out and, and starting that. Human, human civilization will be achieved when all peoples are afforded a healthy environment. That's what environmental justice is about. Um, so, Thank you so much. It was fantastic. Um, I have a, a ton of questions, uh, but I imagine that you all do also. So maybe we can open it up, and if you want to just point at people, that's that would be great. Otherwise, I can point at people. But yeah, what questions do you all have for for Marcella? Um, so I wanted to know what moment in your life made you want to take this path of tackling uh, environmental injustice. Was it in your childhood? Was it mm -hmm. as a teenager? What was that? Was there one moment or was it kind of like a build up of a bunch of different things that made you realize this needs to be addressed, this is urgent? Yeah. Um, so the justice piece for me, um, so uh, for me, it starts in, with um, with love, um, and for me, the galaxy also represents and, and elicits in me um, love and care and concern and compassion. Um, so that, for me, came from about as early as I can remember, is a, um, a sense of, of concern for, for people. Um, justice. Um, started to emerge for me in my freshman year in high school um, when I read Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham Jail. And that letter um, um, was what birthed in me the sense of, oh, I love people, all people are equal, nobody's better or worse. Oh, but this is, there is this inequity. Um, and I do see it. Um, and, and, and a point on, on, on that in, in terms of this work of environmental justice is um, that Martin Luther King was writing from jail. 
he was writing to his allies. He wasn't writing to his enemies, to his, to his opponents. He was writing to his white liberal at the time, white liberal clergy allies who were telling him, you're taking this too far, in essence. You're trying to go too fast. You need to give it time. Um, and so two things come up from, came up for me in terms of this letter. One was this notion of justice, that if we all in fact matter, if nobody is better or worse than anybody else, um, and yet some groups, not just individuals, but whole groups of people um, um, are disproportionately you know, sacrificed. But also, um, some of the strongest pushback comes from allies when they are start to feel uh, threatened about the, and it's often around power, about how, um, about the power equation. But so, so that piece, and, and I'm telling you, environmental justice, sir, I came late to it. It was in 2006. And, and I, I, I came to it because of the LNG effort. Um, and because I say even at that point, this is only 2006, I say that the environmental movement, even in 2006, was a white male um, movement. It was a white male movement <coughs> um, uh, focused predominantly around conservation, around that, which for me, I was like, where, where's my community in that? Like, yeah, I want my community. I want to go hike somewhere. You know, I want, you know, poor people of all shades and colors and types to be able to go hike somewhere beautiful and be inspired. But um, we're dealing with immigration issues. We're dealing with housing issues. We're dealing with, and so, so it was a luxury to, um, um, to at that point to like think about the environment uh, for 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 me for me um, because um, uh, the other myth is that that people of color or low income people don't care about the environment and poll after poll shows that we are actually much more liberal than the mainstream when it comes to environmental issues. So this coming Earth Week, where the, some, some of the clubs on campus are organi organizing a grassroots movement here on campus to promote sustainability, uh, that pillar of our campus that we claim. Um, so within that, I was just wondering, what are some good tools or strategies to create communication between members of that campaign to make CI green again, and how they can speak to each other, how they can reach out to the leadership involved in that, and and how to spread that outside of, uh, I guess that like organization or that campaign, that group of people, to spread more and to just create more conversations about the issues. Yeah, so um, the, for us, over the last 17 years and all the campaigns that, that we've done, um, it starts with research for us. It starts with, with research with the, with the facts, as far as we, um, uh, we can tell. And it's, but it's, it's usually the facts that aren't getting prioritized. Um, because, again, we are rational people. Um, and so most people are working from, from information of some kind. You know, especially you know, department heads and university presidents, they're working from, from information. Um, but what, what we do is we, we find the information um, that usually isn't part of the mainstream. Um, and so that information piece it, um, is very critical, um, is what is the information about um, in essence, yeah, what's missing? You know, um, how much further could we go? Do we need to go? Um, and um, so, so it starts with research. Um, 
And, um, and then um, the next piece is getting a, a core group of folks who, um, who are informed about that. Um, and um, along with that, you know, the whole you know, petition thing, right? Something to show that it's not just your group of four you know, that is asking for this meeting. Right? It's, yeah, it's a group, a small group, core group, always a core group. But hey, we've already had conversations with 100 other students. And we did the survey, or we asked them this, and this is what they said. So it's to demonstrate um, that um, we are, um, that it's a, it's, it's a collective beyond a, a handful of people. Um, while at the same time, you know, doing the, the ongoing education work that has to go on throughout the entire campaign. Um, so there, there's that piece. So that when you, when, when you go into that meeting, um, um, you go in not only with that information, not only with, hey, we've been having conversations with others and they do care about this, and they do support this, um, but also, and here are some tangible next steps. Um, we lay out, we like to lay out both like the big vision, like with the farm worker campaign, like we had this whole farm worker bill of rights and it was sort of like the ideal, you know, we ended up getting one thing out of it, you know, but, but we like to sort of like broaden um, because as a former elected official and a current executive director, um, when you're in, in leader, formal leadership, at least this is my experience, if you got so much on your plate um, that that at times it can really cripple your big picture thinking because just to put out the fires that are going on right now to implement what you planned five years ago that you're just getting to right now right like you really do have a lot on your plate and so it, it's, it's really helpful to have someone remind you of like your aspirational wants like, yeah, you know, we could have, a, our campus could look like this. I'm for that. But then bring it back down to, to some practical things because we can all envision if we have the time, right? Dream, but then how do you get there, right? And, and so, so having some practical things of, you know, it's, we can absolutely do this in the next 12 months or in, you know, two years we can have this. Like something practical, because then they can't dismiss you and say like, yeah, that's nice, we all dream. I'm with you on that. Um, and like, I, how so, are we gonna get there? So more so it's communicating, getting, getting like students on, like to have that same mentality that we're trying to foster in our core group to, to express to the to the administration, like, but then how do we communicate on campus? Is is the best way just walking around talking to people, like that aspect of creating yeah. that communication between all of us? Yes. And up and down yes. through that too. Okay, yeah. So that's that's actually the harder work. Yeah. Um, that's the organizing work. So um, you know, we're in in our society. In, um, um, very much around the world, uh, human kind, we're still uh, stuck in this myth of the hero, um, where it's like, yeah, you know, um, it was because of George Washington that we had this great nation, you know, like this one person, right? And w in the social civil rights movement, um, Martin Luther King, you know, it's because we had Martin Luther King, you know, that we got civil rights. Can't tell you how many leadership um, uh, trainings we do with people who who are interested in running for office, you know, who um, who who are leaders already in their field and their um, who say, you know, oh, yeah, we just need another Cesar Chavez. Like that's what we're waiting for. So there, there, we we still sort of are waiting for you know this 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 hero, but. What, what gets lost in that, which is, makes this work hard, is that we then don't invest in the organizing. Um, because, because that's the hard work of, yeah, one-on-ones. Like, for us, we use 
um, the UFW's United Farm Workers model um, that's called the house meeting model. So we start with what we call PVs, personal visits, and that's one on one. Like we meet someone, someone refers someone, um, and say, hey, you know, can we get together and you know just you know have a conversation. Um, and then um, from there we talk about, yeah, what concerns you, you know, what do you care about? Um, and then that goes to a house meeting, which is that person inviting just a handful of people to the house to then have a group conversation about like, hey, what would you like to see in your community? You know, like, what would it take? You know, from that comes our Junta Grande, which is the group meeting with, you know, 40, 50 people. Um, so, so in terms of student buy-in, um, it's um, I would say that it takes that hard work of like having these starting with one-on-one -on -one conversations, and then like you know, hey, yeah, so you care about this, um, and you see the potential, like you know, how about if you you know invite a couple um, folks you know? Um, so it's starting with the one, and then growing out from there. Um, it takes patience. Like right now, we're in a house meeting. Annually, every year, we do a house meeting camp, what we call a house meeting campaign, to get new people involved. Um, it's a three month, pro for us, it's a three month process. Each organizer sets goals of like, I'm going to have 50 PVs in these next coming weeks. So I got to find those people. I got to, and then I'm going to have X number of house meetings. And then in month three, month four, we're going to have our Junta Grande. Um, and that's their full-time work. That is their full-time work for three to four months. Um, and it's, 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 um, it's hard because it's also not sexy. You know, like, you know, in the documentaries, like, we see the end result. You know, we see these snippets of, like, you know, yeah, we see the person who first started thinking of the idea, you know, and then like, yeah, we got together, and you know, and then we connected with so and so, you know, and then next thing you know, you see the like big protest, right, and they're storming down, you know, the halls of power, right, and then they went. So, um, it, it, the 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 hard work for us is, is that is really <coughs> that organizing piece, and that's very quiet, it's it's not public and it's not like grand and um, but that's 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 if if you believe in the and want to invest in in the personal transformation piece of what what is at the for us at the heart of a of a social campaign what is ultimately a public social campaign of change but that um, is rooted grounded in individual transformation because then, you know, in the long run, it's that, you know, penny wise, pound foolish. Like if you go straight to the protest, like, yeah, you might end up having a thousand students come out and and you might have gotten the president, whoever your, your target is, you know, to, it was just the right moment, it was just the right message, it was just the right, you know, thing and like you actually won, let's say, like ideal. but. You know, protests um, don't go as deep as like when you start with the one-on-one -on -one organizing. At that point, you know, you've changed, you've helped change someone for life. And they will not just do this campaign, but they could end up starting their own campaign, you know, later. Or, you know, now they've become a hardcore environmentalist or something. So it's, it's up to you too, like what your, what your, um, want to invest in. Thank you. Does uh, cost policy ever conflict with the interests of the commu community? Just like like cause policies? Yeah. They ever conflict with the interests of the community? Um, like say for in terms of like short term gains versus long term benefits? And if so, like how do you straddle that line of you know, trying to help them in the short term, but also look out for them in the long term. Um, do you mean, um, what I'm hearing in that is, um, do our issues come from the grassroots up? I, I guess more, sure. um, like say for example, pesticide use. Yes. And that becomes like a issue, and then uh, becomes a government mandate. You can't do pesticide use. 
but then that you know carries over to the company and they can't hire as many workers or I don't know uh, does that ever does that issue ever come up where like a specific issue might affect the workers tangibly mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah and um and um yeah that that's um that's something that we we definitely look at it and 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 think about it and know that um, no no solution as far as we've been able to find you know no solution is like 100 percent everything so um i'll give you an example a tangible example with farm workers we fought hard um to get our local assemblywoman jackie irwin to vote yes for farm worker overtime so Two, in the 1930s, um, uh, this is, uh, they, they, nationally they, they established the Fair Standards Labor Act, that's what I was saying, Fair Labor Standards Act, nationally, um, in the 1930s. Um, it was Southern Democrats who lobbied to exclude farm workers and domestic workers um, from the Fair Labor Standards Act. Well, those were the only two classifications of workers that were excluded. So every other worker it was included. So what, what does that mean? That meant that farm workers and domestic workers um, are not eligible by law to overtime. Um, and so here we were 80 years later, and we're trying to right that wrong. Um, and the counter from the assemblywoman that she was getting from the growers was um, this is going to force us to lay off people because if we have to pay you overtime after eight hours, um, then that's going to cost me money. So I have to lay him off because I can only afford so much. Um, that was one thing that they came back. Um, against giving farm workers overtime that everybody else has had for 80 years. Um, the other thing was, we'll just cut your hours. This is what they told workers. If you support this law, we're gonna cut, we're, you're not going to get the 12 hours. We're going to let you go home after eight hours. So you're actually going to lose money. Um, and so, um, so it comes up in, 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 in various ways. Um, and that was a question we put to the farm workers. Um, and, uh, and, and, and for them, it was, a, it was an issue of dignity. Mm. All workers get paid overtime after eight hours. It's an issue of dignity. Um, and two, they also didn't believe it. <laughs> they're like, uh, you need your crops to be picked. <laughs> there, there's a labor shortage. Um, we're calling your bluff. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, those things come up where, you know, yeah, it, um, uh, you know, with pesticides, right? It's like, you know, we're going to lose crops, right? Um, and so, um, so we try to work with that as best we can. Um, and, but so much... I feel like so much of what we do is so basic, like really based on just basic human rights, humanity. That um, you know, you're 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 telling me that you're going to go out of business. Um, well, you know, um, it's been you know 80, 80 years that people have not had access to overtime pay. You know, like, we'll figure it out. Last, last, maybe last question, and then if folks have follow-ups and stuff, they can just come to the front and we'll let the rest of you guys get out at 7.30. So working like with low-income neighborhoods, so do you feel like economic justice takes precedent over social and environmental justice, or is it just yeah. all? No, it's all of it. I mean, what, what, where, where, it's all of it. And then, I mean, and that's part of the, um, um, the, the, the difficultness of this work is that, that it, it's it's all of it, and so yeah, it's about 
It's about you know um, being strategic. It's about what can we advance. You know, it's about what I mean, we have a, a, a term. What's in the hearts and minds of those that we're working with right now. You know, right now it's school. You know, issues. Right. Yeah, yeah. But it's all important. I mean, when you look at the environmental issues and you know the impacts to health. You know, um, to to inspiration because. Just, just think about what we deny ourselves or, or people. Hey, raise your hand if you've been inspired by nature. Like, if you, you know, going back to that that image, there are literally, you know, children in South Oxnard, you know, for whom, you know, this is all they know. I mean, in, in terms of like, not inspiring sights, like what we are. Uh, denying um, um, or keeping people away from, you know, I mean, more and more I, I think about um, how much the environmental justice movement um, is, is, a, is a dignity issue from the place of, you know, uh, of that very human need, I think, and gift to be inspired. Uh, that's a that's a pretty solid note to end on. So uh, again, a big thank you so much.